I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Katie Weaver, Dan Friedel, and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Katie Weaver. In cities across America, property owners are turning office buildings into homes at an increasing rate. Online housing services company RentCafe.com reports such conversions are at an all-time high in the United States. The company's research considered thousands of U.S. properties that had been remodeled for new purposes. In the last two years, the report says, 32,000 homes were created that way. 41% of them were in former office buildings, Rent Cafe found. Strzok on Forgan is an architect with a national building design company, Solomon Cordwell Wentz. He says repurposing buildings saves the energy that went into their creation. As long as we can get them a new lease on life, then that can be a very sustainable thing to do, Forgan said. The National Association of Realtors, NAR, recently said some property markets are seeing a strong recovery from COVID-19 effects. These include multifamily home, industrial and business space markets, but it reported hotel and office property markets are still suffering. The real estate organization said continuing COVID-19 concerns have slowed the return of workers to their offices. The travel business has also not recovered well. In addition, office rents, the amount of money businesses pay to use space, have gone down. We're at an inflection point, possibly, Forgan said. In business, that means a major change in direction. His company has converted a tall office building in San Francisco into apartments. The company is working on a similar project in Hawaii. He said, Employers have not made radical changes in the amount of space that they need. But Forgan noted that if some workers do not want to return to their offices, the demand for office space will go down. Converting old buildings is a sustainable way to add new housing. That is because needed road and public transportation systems are often already in the same place. Conversions can also simplify legal approval processes because the buildings are already officially registered in most cases. It's maybe faster or easier to get a conversion project approved, Forgan said. But there are also barriers. Those barriers are the common reason why office-to-apartment projects are not more common. Zoning and permitting are probably two of the biggest costs, said Doug Ressler. He is with Yardy Matrix, a company that provided some of the data for the Rent Cafe report. Zoning describes local rules for the use of property, 
and are different for every area of the country. Most have been started from local ordinances and built up, said Ressler. Some areas, for example, are not zoned for multifamily housing, only single family housing. Also, requirements for living spaces differ from those for employment space, including levels of natural light. Older buildings can present problems. They often require new mechanical, electrical, and pipe systems. Historic office buildings, however, are often good candidates for conversion because of their design. An NAR opinion study of its members in the business property market found that 84% of them use the same amount of office space as before the pandemic, but 11% reported a decrease in office space. People have not made decisions yet, architect Forgan said. I don't think the office market has really reacted to that yet. But he noted that it is possible a lot of office space may become available in the future. NAR reports that retail spaces led by shopping centers, marketplaces with many nationwide stores, are continuing to recover Big department stores, which have been disappearing, might also be getting a new lease on life. These spaces are being turned into places where companies can store and send products that are bought online. Similar but smaller and more local shopping centers are known as strip malls. The NAR said they are also coming back to life. Part of that recovery might be linked to the willingness of owners to get new businesses to use their space. Ressler said strip malls are being converted for new use by medical offices and healthcare providers. He said hospitals that are looking to reduce costs might create urgent care centers in strip malls where stores have closed. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. The United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as COP26, is continuing in Glasgow, Scotland. World leaders, climate experts, and activists have gathered in an effort to negotiate new action plans to fight the widespread effects of climate change. Technology is likely to play a big part in helping the world reach its climate goals in the future. Here is a closer look at some possible technology-based solutions. Fusion is the process that fires the sun, but some experts say it could someday power our homes. Fusion happens when the nuclei of two atoms are subjected to extreme heat. This leads to the formation of a new larger atom and large amounts of energy. One problem is that the process itself requires a large amount of energy. Developers of the technology have not yet performed a fusion reaction that releases more energy than it requires. In addition, running an electric power plant off of fusion would require the resulting heat to be contained in an economical way. Still, scientists at Britain's Oxford University, America's Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and other places say they are making progress. The British government believes a working model for producing electricity can be in place by the year 2040. 
advanced nuclear plants would be smaller than today's massive nuclear reactors. Experts say they could be used in rural areas and could take over for wind and solar power when the sun goes down or the wind dies. But advanced nuclear reactors are difficult and costly to build. Critics say they would also create more dense waste, and they would run on uranium, which is far more enriched than fuel used in today's reactors. That could make some advanced reactors more appealing to militants seeking materials to make weapons. In the United States, Bill Gates has said he aims to build a reactor that uses advanced nuclear technology for about one billion dollars. His plans call for many advanced nuclear plants to be operational by the 2030s. China, Russia, and Japan are also working on the technology. Last month, a Swiss company announced it had launched the world's largest carbon capturing plant in Iceland. The system captures carbon dioxide, or CO2, directly from the air and puts the gas underground. Currently, there are 15 direct air capture plants operating worldwide. The International Energy Agency (IEA) estimates the plants capture more than 9,000 metric tons of CO2. Per year, while that might sound like a lot, it is about equal to the amount produced by about two thousand cars over the same period. Carbon capturing costs are currently high, in the range of six hundred dollars per metric ton of CO2 captured. But supporters say those costs will fall as the technology improves. Supporters also say tax breaks for businesses in the U.S. and other countries could help the technology. But critics, including the environmental group Sierra Club, say offering large credits could actually lead. To more plants continuing to burn fossil fuels, hydrogen can be mixed with natural gas to make a cleaner burning fuel. This could power a fuel cell vehicle. Such a vehicle would release environmentally friendly water vapors. So-called clean hydrogen can be produced using energy methods such as wind and solar, but those methods are more costly than gray hydrogen, which is made with fossil fuels. Another possibility, known as blue hydrogen, can be made in natural gas plants that capture carbon. But some scientists say that process can release methane gas, which would make hydrogen no cleaner than natural gas itself. Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil exporter, is planning to build a five billion dollar plant to produce clean hydrogen. Geothermal power plants capture heat up to 370 degrees Celsius, far below the Earth's surface. The heat creates steam that can turn turbines to produce electricity. The United States, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Kenya lead the world in geothermal electricity production. But the technology would need to greatly expand to become a major alternative to fossil fuels.
Experts estimate the U.S. has the capacity to produce 10% of the country's current power demand through geothermal power. But startup costs to build the technology are high. This has prevented major investments so far. Countries lacking in fossil fuel resources, including Japan and Singapore, are seeking to develop geothermal power. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to the Making of a Nation. American history in VOA Special English. Two summers had gone by since the start of the American Civil War, and the North had not yet won a major battle in Virginia. The Army of the Potomac, the strongest of the Union armies, had tried to seize Richmond, the Confederate capital. General George McClellan moved the army up to the very gates of the city, but then General Robert E. Lee led his southern forces in a fierce attack. It smashed McClellan's army and drove them away from Richmond. Morris Joyce and Jack Moyles continue the story of the Civil War. President Abraham Lincoln and his new chief general Henry Halleck put together a new northern force. They called it the Army of Virginia. They gave command of it to General John Pope, a successful fighter in the West. Pope began to move south toward Richmond. Halleck ordered McClellan to bring his army up to join Pope. Together, they could smash through the Confederate defenses around Richmond. Lee decided to hit Pope before McClellan could join him. He left a few thousand troops to guard Richmond, then took the rest north. Lee moved up to the Rappahannock River, across from Pope's army. Lee sent Stonewall Jackson with 24,000 men on a quick march around the western end of Pope's lines. Jackson and his men marched more than 80 kilometers in two days. They got behind Pope and seized a huge northern supply center at Manassas. Pope moved to smash them. They burned the captured supplies... Then they moved a few kilometers away to a long, low hill just northwest of the Bull Run battleground where southern forces defeated a northern army a year before. Jackson hid his troops in woods along the hill and waited for General Lee to arrive with the rest of the southern army. But before Lee could get there... Union troops, thousands of them, marched down the road below Jackson. Jackson decided to attack, to hold them there until Lee arrived with help. The fighting was furious. Neither side broke. The fighting died down at the end of the day, and Jackson's men moved back to their positions on higher ground. They made their lines along a partly built railroad on the side of the hill. From his headquarters on the hill, Jackson watched the northern forces prepare for battle. Many thousands of the enemy were marching into position. Pope brought up all his soldiers, and others were on the way from bases near Washington. Several thousand of McClellan's troops commanded by General Porter, were arriving from the south.
It was a mighty force, much larger than Jackson's army. Jackson was worried. He sent an officer back to find General Lee. He sent a message. Lee must hurry. Jackson faced a big army. Pope's army was large, but it was poorly organized. The men had been rushed into position. The order to attack was given before all the troops were ready. So the attack began slowly, and Jackson was able to fight it off. But then more and more northern soldiers joined the fight. The two sides struggled for hours in the hot summer sun. Jackson's men almost broke. Men prayed for the long day to end. The sun seemed to stand still. Finally, the sun went down, and the battlefield became dark. Jackson's men had held, but they paid a terrible price. Thousands were killed or wounded. Northern losses were even greater. Most of the Union troops had fought bravely. They had hit the Confederate lines time after time. But one large group of soldiers did not get into the battle at all that day. This was the group from McClellan's Army of the Potomac, led by Fitz John Porter. Pope had ordered Porter to strike at the right end of Jackson's lines. Porter took his troops several kilometers past Jackson's right and stopped them. His soldiers remained there all day, out of the battle. Porter said later he believed the Confederate forces were too strong for his men. Other groups of McClellan's men were arriving in Alexandria, 30 kilometers to the east. Pope asked that they be sent to help him. McClellan was ordered to send them immediately, but he refused to do so. He said they were not in condition to fight, and he would not send them. General Pope still thought he was facing only Jackson's army. He refused to believe reports that Lee had arrived on the battlefield with 30,000 more southern soldiers. Pope thought Lee was still far to the west of Manassas. Pope knew that Jackson's army had taken a terrible beating in the two days of bloody fighting, and he was sure that Jackson would try to withdraw the next day to retreat to the west. Pope divided his forces that night. He left thousands in place in front of Jackson's lines. The others were moved back. They were ordered to get ready for a march west to block Jackson's retreat. Pope made a terrible mistake. Jackson was not planning to retreat. He was waiting with Lee to smash the northern army. And that is what happened the next day. Northern troops attacked Jackson's lines. The fighting was bitter. Pope's forces almost smashed through. But then Lee ordered his men to move forward to help Jackson. Confederate artillery broke up the northern attack. When the northern troops began to retreat, Lee and Jackson attacked with all their might. 
many of Pope's men were not prepared for battle. They were standing together in groups, ready for marching. They could not stop the southern attack. The Confederates pushed Pope's army back across the old Bull Run battlefield. Near the end of the day, northern forces succeeded in organizing a stronger defensive line. The southern attack slowed down, then stopped. Lee sent Jackson around the north end of Pope's line to try to stop the northern retreat. Lee did not want the defeated Union army to escape. He wanted to destroy it. But heavy rain held up Jackson's troops. They were discovered and attacked by a strong northern force. Jackson could move no farther. He could not stop Pope's retreat to Centerville and Washington. The northern army escaped. But it left behind thousands and thousands of dead and wounded. Confederate doctors treated their own men, then tried to help the wounded soldiers of the other side. General Lee permitted northern medical wagons to return to the battlefield, and they began to carry the wounded back to Centerville. Groups of McClellan's army arriving from Alexandria met Pope's men in Centerville. They laughed and shouted at the tired, beaten soldiers. Many said they were glad that Pope had lost. One of McClellan's generals, Samuel Sturgis, greeted Pope at Centerville. I always told you, Pope, that if they gave you enough rope, you would hang yourself. What happened at Bull Run created bitter anger among the people of the North, anger against their military leaders. People felt that a year had been wasted, that thousands had died for no real purpose. The year before, southern troops sent a northern army fleeing from Bull Run. Now it was happening again. The Army of the Potomac was back where it started. As the facts of the battle became known, cries of anger became even louder. The people demanded answers. Why did McClellan and his men move so slowly? Why did they refuse to go to Pope's aid? Why did Pope let Jackson get behind him? Why were 14,000 soldiers lost? Most members of Lincoln's cabinet believed McClellan was responsible. Treasury Secretary Chase said McClellan should be shot. War Secretary Stanton said he should be dismissed immediately. He and three other cabinet members signed an oath demanding that Lincoln remove McClellan as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Lincoln agreed that what McClellan had done was shocking. He said it was clear that McClellan wanted Pope to fail, but Lincoln said he would not remove McClellan. He said he knew that McClellan was not an aggressive general, but he said McClellan was a good organizer who could build the defeated army into a strong force. General Robert E. Lee, however, would not wait while McClellan rebuilt the army. He decided to carry the war to the north. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.